We are making great strides in our study of the Messiah. This is episode number nine from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. Our website is torchweb.org. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. Last time, we established a very important principle, and that is the inevitability of Messiah. Regardless of what we choose, regardless of what path we take, regardless of any decisions that we may or may not make, Messiah is happening, whether we like it or not. Every choice, both good and bad, inch us a bit closer to Messiah. But if Messiah is inevitable and it's also path dependent, it's also contingent on our choices, then we said last time that Messiah must be variable as well. Messiah is not just one thing. There are many different versions of Messiah. There are many, perhaps, an infinite potential paths to the Messiah. And the kind of Messiah that we get will look very different depending on the potential path that we take to get there. So we established last time that Messiah is a necessary component of creation. If the world has a beginning, this world and its current orientation, it also has an end. And we're constantly getting closer to the end regardless of what we choose. We're marching inexorably towards this endpoint. And there is an end. The verse tells us God placed an end. There's a culmination to the darkness. But that daybreak, if you will, can come because of us in our merit or it could be despite of us, notwithstanding our lack of merit. The destination is fixed the means by which we arrive at said destination, well, that's up to us. And the kind of experience that we receive is determined by the kind of path that we take to get there. It's interesting, if you look at the sources, when it talks about the end, the Messiah, the final end, the word that it uses very often in our literature is kates, the end. But very often it uses the term kitsin, which means Plural ends, the ends, the Messiah, the Kitsin. And the reason is because there's lots of different endpoints. Every time is propitious for Messiah, but of one variety or another. And again, this is the point that we want to reinforce. Not all paths to Messiah are identical. And it seems that the particular path that we choose will have enormous ramifications on the type of Messiah that we will earn. And today I want to investigate the various different domains in which this concept, the concept of the variability of Messiah, is manifested. And I think this idea it will help us resolve many problems that arise in the literature. But it's also, it's very helpful to encourage us to do whatever we can to choose a good path to Messiah. Because if we choose a good path, we end up with a pleasant and helpful and beneficial and enjoyable and productive Messiah. So let's go through some of the different areas of variability of Messiah. We already talked about some of them. So we spoke about in the past about repentance. We're going to repent before Messiah, but what sort of repentance? Will it be internally inspired? Or if we don't repent, or we don't choose, or we don't opt to repent, then God will appoint a Haman-like king who will coerce us to repent. Again, there's variability, different types of experiences that precipitate the arrival of Messiah. We spoke already about the very interesting Talmud that says the Messiah will come in a generation that's entirely righteous or a generation that is entirely wicked. Those experiences, those paths are very different in all sorts of ways. But I want to introduce some new variables to the discussion. The Talmud of the Book of Sanhedrin, page 98a, and that's where you'll find a lot of the Talmuds about Messiah, 97, 98, 96, 99, etc. The Talmud cites a verse in Isaiah, chapter 60, the final verse of chapter 60, 
It's talking about the arrival of Messiah. And it says two words right next to each other that are opposites. Be'ita, in its time, Achishana, I will expedite it. Be'ita, in its time, what does that mean? There's a specific time. We don't know when the time is. God knows when the time it is. But there is a date, there's a point, that's the right time for Messiah. And Messiah will come in its time. And the very next word is, Achishana, I will expedite it. I will hasten it. It will come quickly. It will come before its time. So you have a verse that says two words juxtaposed to each other that are literally opposites, or not literally opposites, but they're not compatible with each other. How could he possibly reconcile this verse? Be it done its time, not earlier. Achishana. I will hasten it. It will, in fact, come earlier. Says the Talmud, Zahu, if they are meritorious, then Achishana, then God will hasten it. Lo Zahu, if they're not meritorious, then Be'ita, in its time. When will Messiah come? The timing of Messiah is variable. Yes, there is a fixed time. It won't delay past that final time. But if we are meritorious, it can come earlier. Now, this is found elsewhere in the literature. It's found in the Madrash, for example. The Madrash is talking about the wonderful transformation that happens when Israel observes Shabbos properly. If the Jews observe Shabbos, even once, right away, Messiah will come. This is a little bit different than the Talmud. Talmud says that they have to observe twice, which is interesting. But the Midrash says once. Why? Because Shabbos is such a, an important mitzvah. It's such a foundational mitzvah. It's equal to all the mitzvahs put together. And thus, if you have one mitzvah that equals all 613, and you do that one mitzvah properly, well, you've done all 613 properly, and that is complete repentance. And as we mentioned, if there is complete repentance, there is a hastening of Messiah. Continues the Midrash. God said to Israel, so to speak, even though I made a fixed endpoint, the Messiah will come regardless. You repent, you don't repent. You choose to repent. You are coerced to repentance. There is an endpoint. And Messiah will definitely come before that endpoint. Nevertheless, with inspired repentance, if you opt in, if you embrace it, even for one day, I will bring Messiah, not in its time, earlier, before the end point, God will hasten it. So when will Messiah come? When is redemption happening? So the Talmud tells us, the Midrash tells us, it depends, it's variable. If we are meritorious, if we repent, if we embrace Shabbos, then it will hasten. Achishana, it will come early. If we are not meritorious, then it will come in its time. Now, there's a fascinating study as to whether or not we've had a precedent for an expedited redemption. As we mentioned in the past, our history is is these cycles of exile and redemption. We talked about the, the four exiles. We talked about Egypt being the prototype. There's a fascinating study as to whether or not the Egyptian exile ended early or not. How long were the descendants of Abraham slated to be exiled in Egypt? So the verse tells us, Genesis chapter 15, the covenant of the parts, God tells Abraham, you should surely know that your descendants will be enslaved and oppressed in a land that's not theirs for 400 years, and they'll leave with great wealth, etc., and the nation that oppresses them, I will judge. We're told the precise amount of years of this exile, 400 years. Well, how long were the Jews, were the descendants of Abraham actually in Egypt? Kind of depends how you count. When does the clock start ticking? 
But we know that Jacob, from when he descended with the 70 souls to Egypt, until the Exodus, it was 210 years. So is this an example of the Exodus, of the redemption, of the Messiah, so to speak, of this exile coming early, 190 years early? Is this an example of this idea that an exile can be truncated and a redemption can be expedited? This is a very complicated question because we find different answers. Now, Rashi says no. In his commentary to Genesis 15, he says that the original promise, the prophecy to Abraham, it was moot on the location. It doesn't say your descendants will be slaves, foreigners in the land of Egypt. It says in a land that's not theirs. Abraham sojourned in Canaan. Isaac sojourned there. Jacob sojourned there. They didn't live there. It was of our land. So even the land of Canaan qualifies for being foreigners in a foreign land. Now, the promise was that your descendants will be foreigners in a foreign land. So that clock can only begin once Isaac is born. Abraham has a descendant. And that's why she tells us, when was Isaac born? Isaac was born on the first day of Pesach, exactly 400 years prior to the Exodus. From that point, the birth of Isaac, the fulfillment of the prophecy began. Your descendants, already Isaac, will be foreigners in a foreign land, partially in the land of Canaan and partially in Egypt. And then the Exodus happens exactly 400 years to the day in perfect fulfillment of the prophecy. And thus, there was no expedited exodus. It all happened in its time. Now, Ramban, as well, in his commentary to Exodus chapter 2, verse 25, the verses are talking about the suffering of the nation in Egypt, the intensification of the oppression of the Egyptians, and they cried out to God. Says the Ramban, The Torah tells us about the Almighty processing, so to speak, the experience of the Jews in Egypt. God heard their cries. God remembered his covenant. These are all verses. God saw, God knew, for I knew their pain. Why does the Torah emphasize how God was, so to speak, processing the experience of the Jewish people in Egypt? Says the Ramban, because the appointed time for the Exodus had arrived but they were undeserving. And God forced them, God coerced them to repent. And therefore God made it so difficult for them and he got them to awaken that that flicker within them that wasn't yet extinguished. And they cried out to God and in that merit, they were redeemed, not before the time, but in the correct time. And Rashi, by the way, says the same thing, right? Before the Exodus, they have a few mitzvahs that they're given, the blood of the pastoral offering, the blood of the circumcision. And Rashi as well says, this is in chapter 12, I believe, of Exodus, that the appointed time had come and they had no merits. So God, so to speak, forced them to have some merits by giving them these mitzvahs. So these great commentators are telling us that the Exodus is an example of redemption happening exactly in its time. And this perhaps can serve as an example of the idea that if you don't choose repentance, returning to God on your own, well, then the Almighty will intensify the experience of the uh, rulers, of the overlords around you. They'll be like a Haman-like king, and that will force your hand, and that will enable you to be redeemed in the correct time. So we have Rashi and Ramban, and of course this is all based upon the Midrash and other sources. They tell us that the Egyptian redemption was not an example of the hastening of redemption. Now elsewhere in the Midrash we see otherwise. The Midrash tells us, this is in Psikta, Dorf Kahana 5.7, Moshe came to the Jewish people and says, okay, it's time. We're going to leave. This is the month that we're leaving. And they tell Moshe, can't be. 
how can we be redeemed? Didn't God tell Abraham that they will enslave your descendants for 400 years? We did the math. We only have 210. It's not in the correct time. So Moshe responds, says the Midrash, yes, it's not the correct time, but God wants to redeem you. And he doesn't care about math. He doesn't care about calculations. He's going to jump over the mountains. He's going to leapfrog all these calculations and these endpoints and these times. doesn't matter. Now we're leaving. We're leaving early. So we have different takes, so to speak, on this question as to whether or not the Egyptian exodus, was it a version of an expedited redemption or was it an example of the redemption happening in its time? Now, according to, this is maybe a little bit uh, inside baseball here, according to the opinion that says that we left early, you would have to say that the promise that we'll be there for 400 years Either we avoided that because that was a threat, or we can retrofit it to the birth of Isaac, and maybe the intention was that we would stay there for 400 years actually in Egypt, but actually there's a way to change it, so to speak, post facto, and retrofit it to the prophecy and say, well, okay, let's start the calculation a little bit earlier, and the birth of Isaac will be the starting point. But this is, again, a very interesting discussion. Was the exodus from Egypt, was that an example of an expedited redemption or was it in its time? Now, to take this a little bit further, I know we're getting a little bit in the weeds here, so you forgive me. According to the Midrash that tells us that the Egyptian exodus was, in fact, expedited. They were supposed to stay for another 190 years. But for some reason, they left early. Well, the Talmud tells us that you have to be meritorious to leave early. What was the merit that the nation had that gave them the right, that gave them the privilege to leave early? The Midrash doesn't say. It just says that God disregarded the calculation. He leapt over the mountains and all the calculation, leave the math behind. So it's an interesting question. If there is a concept of expedited redemption and that is contingent on the state of the nation. They have to be deserving. Why were they deserving? And in this question, there are various different answers. There is another Midrash. I know it's a little complicated here, but let's follow, follow, follow here. Follow. There is another major that says the Jewish people were meritorious in Egypt. They did not assimilate or acculturate into the ways of their neighbors. They didn't change their garments. They didn't change their language. Their names remained the same. They didn't speak Lashon Ara. They weren't promiscuous with the Egyptians. Those merits, perhaps, they were the grounds for the hastening of the redemption. But there's another idea. This is going to add another principle to this idea of the timing of Messiah. The Kabbalists tell us that the nation in Egypt had descended to very low spiritual nadirs. And they were on the brink of irreparable, irreversible spiritual collapse. There are 50 realms of impurity and they were on the 49th level of impurity, and they were knocking on the door on level 50, and level 50 is the point of no return. And they needed a salvation. And the time was such that this was the only way that they can be saved from eternal spiritual destruction. And that's why they were redeemed early. So according to this, we have a new insight here. Timing of redemption. It could be in its time. It could be early. Why would it be early? Now we have two reasons why redemption and, by extension, Messiah can be expedited. It can arrive before its time due to our merits or perhaps due to our complete lack of merits when we're on the doorstep of the 50th realm of impurity and there's a risk of reaching the point of no return Well, both 
would be grounds for the untimely expediting of Messiah. Now, one more point here. We can speculate, perhaps, that the Talmud that we've mentioned several times, the Talmud that says that the Son of David, Messiah, will arrive in a generation that's entirely righteous or entirely wicked. We're trying to figure out what that means. Perhaps one of the interpretations of this Talmud may be that the Talmud is talking about the expedited Messiah. Not in its time. When it comes early. It can be unnaturally hastened. How so? In two very different circumstances. In a generation that is entirely righteous, there's overwhelming righteousness, well, then we can earn the expedited Messiah. In a generation that's entirely wicked, due to our overwhelming lack of righteousness, and we're on the precipice of the 50th realm, and there's no other option other than the immediate arrival of Messiah to prevent this catastrophic and irreversible crossover to realm number 50, that also perhaps would be grounds for the expedited Messiah. We can meritoriously expedite when the generation is entirely righteous, or we can expedite in the exact opposite way. We can be so non-meritorious that the hastening must happen to prevent the total collapse of this experiment. And this is all a very long way of saying that Messiah is variable. And the timing when Messiah will come, it's another area in which the variability of Messiah is expressed. Now, this idea, this principle can help resolve some very problematic citations that we find in the Talmud. The Talmud of the Book of Rosh Hashanah, page 10a, going into 10b, it presents a very interesting disagreement between two of the greatest sages of the Mishnaic era. Rabbi Eliezer says, in the month of Tishrei, which is the month that we have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot, in the month of Tishrei, the world was created. In the month of Tishrei, the forefathers were born. In the month of Tishrei, the forefathers died. In the month of Nisan, on the festival of Pesach, Isaac was born. On Rosh Hashanah, Sarah, Rachel, and Hannah were all redeemed, i.e. they conceived. On Rosh Hashanah, Joseph left prison. On Rosh Hashanah, the work, the enslavement of our forefathers in Egypt was suspended. In the month of Nisan, the exodus happened. In the month of Tishrei, Messiah will come. So we have these two important months, Tishrei, the month of Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, and, and Sukkot, and Nisan, the month of Pesach. They're half a year apart. They're equidistant from each other. And we have a list of all these things that happen either in this month or on that month. That is the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Yeshua says, no, in the month of Nisan, the world was created. In the month of Nisan, the forefathers were born. In the month of Nisan, the forefathers died. In Pesach, on Pesach, Isaac was born. That they agree. On Rosh Hashanah, Hannah, Sarah, Rachel were redeemed. On Rosh Hashanah, Joseph left prison. On Rosh Hashanah, the work, the enslavement was suspended. In the month of Nisan, they were redeemed. The Exodus happened. In the month of Nisan, the future redemption, the Exodus, will happen. So this is a very interesting debate, and we can spend a lot of time talking about what exactly is going on over here. But for our purposes, let's focus on the final statement of these two sages, respectively. Rabbi Eliezer says, In Nisan, Passover. The Exodus happened. However, Messiah will come in Tishrei. Rabbi Yeshua says, no. In Nisan, the Exodus happened. And also in Nisan, Messiah will come. So as an aside, we see that the you know, both opinions are comparing 
the Exodus to Messiah. This is, again, another confirmation to the idea that the Egyptian Exodus serves as this prototype for all redemptions, and that's why Messiah is going to be compared to the Exodus. Either that they're similar and they're going to happen in the same month, or they're similar and they're still not going to happen in the same month. But when will Messiah come? So we have two opinions, either in Nisan, the month of Pesach, or in Tishrei, the month of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. What about the rest of the year? There are 10 other months. Evidently, everyone agrees that those other 10 months are just not candidates for Messiah. That's what the Talmud tells us. What about our belief that we say in the Animam and the declaration of this principle of faith? I believe with perfect faith. Every day it can come or it shall come. Every day includes those other 10 months, you would imagine. It also seems that we have Talmudic evidence to the contrary. Listen to this. The Talmud tells us if you have a person who accepts upon themselves a vow to be a Nazir, Nazir, someone that can't cut their hair, can't drink any alcohol, can't come into contact with the dead for a fixed amount of time. But they can also accept that vow conditionally. If it rains tomorrow, I'll become a Nazir, as an example. What if someone says, the day that Messiah comes, behold, I'm going to be a Nazir. So every day, is he allowed to drink wine? Is he allowed to come into contact with the dead? If it's the morning, the Messiah comes four in the afternoon, well, that day, he became a Nazir retroactively from the beginning of the day. So can he drink wine any day of the year? Says the Talmud, yes. On Shabbos, he could drink wine. On Yom Tov, on the festivals, he can drink wine. But every other day, he is not allowed to drink wine because maybe later on in that same day, Messiah will come. So we have Talmudic evidence from this very strange case where someone accepts a vow of a Nazir conditionally. We have evidence that every day, of course, not including Shabbos and festivals, but every day is a candidate for Messiah to come. And the question is obvious. According to Rabbi Yezer, it's only going to come in the month, potentially in the month of Tishrei. According to Rabbi Yeshua, it's only going to come in the month of Nisan. What about the rest of the year? E.R., Sivan, Tammuz, Av, Elul, all these other months. Cheshvan, Kislev, Teve, Shvat, Adar. We have a 10 months of the year that are not candidates, evidently. This is the question. How come someone who makes this very unusual vow is not allowed to drink wine on all those other months? And the answer that our sages tell us to this question, you probably guessed it. There are two different ways the Messiah could come. If they are meritorious, I will expedite it. I will hasten it. It will come before its time. If they're not meritorious, well, we'll have to wait to the time. And Rabbi Eliezer and Yeshua are not talking about the days that God can bring Messiah. If he expedites it, they're talking about when is the end point? What point of the year? Is the Messiah going to come if we are not meritorious? The Ita, in its time. And therefore, in its time, according to one of them, according to Rabbi Yezer, it's Tishrei. And in its time, according to the other, it's Nisan. But we can hasten it. And if we hasten it, well, every day can be a candidate. And the commentaries here invoke the Talmud about the great rabbi who met Messiah at the gates of Rome. Remember, he was the the leper who was bandaging and unbandaging his bandages one at a time. When are you coming? They're coming today. If you repent. The timing of Messiah is variable. In its time, there's a fixed point, if we're not meritorious, either in Tishrei or in Nisan. 
However, it can be hastened. It can be expedited. And that will be every day as a candidate for that. Every day, besides for Shabbos and Yom Tov. Similarly, listen to this question. A Kohen is not allowed to enter the temple or to do any service in the temple if they are inebriated. Can a Kohen, can a priest drink wine today? What's going to be if Messiah comes today and the temple is rebuilt today and we need a Kohen to do service in the temple today and you're drunk? So the Talmud actually brings a dispute. According to Rabbi Judah the Prince, you are permitted as a Kohen to drink today. What's going to be when Messiah comes? I don't know. We'll deal with it then. We're not so concerned about Messiah coming today. According to the other rabbis, they say, no, it's prohibited. Kohanim must be completely sober. They could drink on Shabbos, make Kiddush on Shabbos. They can drink on Yom Tov, but not the rest of the year. And again, the same question can be asked. They should only withhold from wine, Tishrei, or Nisan. Why would they be prohibited from drinking the rest of the year? And the answer, of course, is that those endpoints, Tishrei or Nisan, that is talking about the timely Messiah. But if we are meritorious, or perhaps if we are on the brink of realm number 50, then any day is a potential time for Messiah. And that's why, at least according to the rabbis, Kohanim today should stay away from the alcohol. Now, the Talmud on the same page in the book of Sanhedrin on page 98a, it contrasts two verses. One talks about, or one implies, a very speedy and miraculous revelation of Messiah. And one talks about a lethargic and plotting Messiah. A pitiful man on a donkey, dragging their feet, going really slowly. Which is it? Will Messiah come like the sand with the clouds of the heaven very quickly? Or will be slow and plotting like a pauper arriving on his donkey? Says the Talmud, if you're meritorious, it's fast. If you're not meritorious then it will be slow. So we have repentance. We have the generation righteous or not. We have the timing in a time or or expedited. We have the speed and all these are variable elements of Messiah. But there's more. What's the experience of Messiah like? Everything that we have seen hitherto has presented a very idyllic, utopian world. Everyone's going to acknowledge God. The pursuit of wisdom will encompass the world like the water covers the seabed, and the Jewish people will be recognized as God's people in the world, and the temple will be rebuilt, and all the laws will be restored. It sounds very pleasant. Is that too variable? The Talmud says, yes. The Talmud of the Book of Sanhedrin, page 97a, it tells us that there are three things that happen in a very surprising way. No one's paying attention. No one's ready for it. All of a sudden, these three things happen. Number one, Messiah. Number two, a mitzia. When you find something, you find the treasure, you stumble upon something. Number three, a scorpion. No one plans to encounter a scorpion. It shows up, boom, it pounces. If you find something, it's a surprise. You don't plan on it. Scorpion, it's a surprise. Messiah is a surprise. It happens suddenly and there's no forewarning. Now, what does this mean? Why does the Talmud lump together these three very different, apparently random things together? These are the three surprises. So the Maharsha, one of the great commentators on the on the Talmud, he says something incredible and terrifying, and this is a sentiment that is echoed by others. It's all one idea. The subject of this Talmud is Messiah. Messiah is sudden. However, 
Sudden can mean good. Sudden, what a surprise. It could be awful. It could be terrible. What an awful surprise. I was not ready for this. If we are meritorious, then the surprise of Messiah is delightful. It's something like a, so wonderful, this unexpected b- a boon that we receive, this unexpected windfall that we get, this unexpected treasure that we find. But if we're not meritorious, it's also unexpected. But it's bad. It's painful. It's deadly like an unexpected encounter with a scorpion. Messiah is sudden. That is fixed. Is it good? Is it bad? It depends. It's variable. We can get an unexpected treasure Messiah. We can also get a venomous scorpion Messiah. Messiah is unexpected. It's a surprise. It happens all of a sudden. But it is highly variable. It can be delightful, like finding a treasure. Or it can be deadly and awful, like a scorpion bite. This is a a new idea that we haven't encountered yet. Messiah can be very unpleasant. Now, What does this mean? In what ways can Messiah be equivalent to a scorpion bite? So there are a variety of ideas that are featured in the literature that perhaps can explain to us why Messiah potentially can be bad. Of course, we could go back to to Egypt. Rashi tells us, the Midrash tells us, Not all the Jews made it out of Egypt. In fact, the majority didn't. 80% died. Think about it. Only one out of five survived. That's an awful retention rate. We think of the Exodus as just this unbridled joy. It was joyous. But think about what that's like. 80% of the nation is gone. That's awful. Not everyone made the cut in the original Exodus. Potentially, this can be a fulfillment, again, of, of if we so choose, of a scorpion messiah. Maybe there could be a similar loss of the nation. We'll talk more about this, of course, in an upcoming episode. But there is this description, or at least discussion of an apocalyptic war that coincides with Messiah. And when it comes with Messiah, it's a big discussion. We'll get into it. Perhaps it may last only a few hours. It'll be on the festival of Sukkot, perhaps, and it's going to have catastrophic consequences. The war of Gog and Magog. That is featured in the prophecies. That perhaps can be part of the scorpion, at least the potential for scorpion, in the arrival of Messiah. Elsewhere, the Talmud of the Book of Sota, page 49b, talks about various tribulations and spiritual degradations that are associated with the arrival of Messiah. And these two are conditional. If we are meritorious, it can be very pleasant. This is a very important discovery in our subject. It's not pleasant, but that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand Messiah. And our sources tell us Messiah can be very, very, very unpleasant. That too is part of the spectrum of options that are available to us. Now, a feature of Messiah is the reinstitution, rebuilding of the temple. And we'll talk about that also at length, please God. How does the temple get built? Who will build the temple? Again, we find conflicting ideas in the sources. Rashi, in the book of Talmud, the book of Sukkah, page 41a, and Tosfos as well on the same page, the Talmud talking about the building of the temple at night and building the temple on a festival. 
that's what the Talmud's talking about. And Rashi says, wait a minute, we're not allowed to build the temple at night, and we're not allowed to build a temple on a festival. So how does the Talmud entertain the idea that on a festival and at night, the temple will be rebuilt? That's against the rules. Says Rashi, yeah, that's true, it's against the rules. But that's only if the temple is manually built. But the third temple, the upcoming temple that we are awaiting, we're not going to build it ourselves. It will be built and completed by God in heaven on high and it will be revealed and it will descend from heaven. Quotes a verse to that effect. Who's going to build the third temple? Rashi, Tosfos tell us. It's God. It's from heaven. And that sort of building, well, it operates in different rules. It could be at night. It could be on the festival. No problem. Now, you do recall, we mentioned this a few times already, when Rambam talks about Messiah, one of the elements of Messiah is, of course, to to restore the Davidic monarchy and to reinstate all the laws and to gather all the Jews from their exiles and building the temple. One of the ways, Rambam tells us, to actually vet Messiah, if he is legit, is did he build the temple? So Rambam is telling us that the third temple is going to be built by human labor under the direction of Messiah. We have a description, third temple, we're are waiting for it, we're praying for it. Who's going to build it? We have different answers in the sources. Now, Rashi, in his commentary on the Talmud, tells us it's going to be built by God. Rashi, in his commentary to Ezekiel, when at the end of Ezekiel, we have these very detailed architectural plans for temple number three, Rashi tells us that we need to know the dimensions and the plans for the third temple because we need to build it. So wait a minute. You tell us in your commentary to the Talmud that God will build it. It'll descend from heaven. And now you're telling us that we need to know the dimensions for us to build it? Of course, the answer you already know. There are different possibilities. It's variable in the ideal world if we are meritorious. God will build it for us. If we are not meritorious, it'll happen later. It'll happen slower. It'll happen despite of us. It'll happen perhaps in a scorpion-like version. And we will have to build it ourselves. If we are meritorious, God will hasten. God will expedite Messiah and miraculously build a temple for us. If we're worthy, it will come earlier. It will descend from heaven, like Rashi tells us in his commentary to the Talmud. If we are not meritorious, we'll have to wait in its time. And it will be built by human labor by us. Now, in general, the notion of the miracles of Messiah, the sources indicate, and we spoke about this at length, that Exodus like, Exodus esque miracles will accompany the Messiah. Now, Rambam, we read, he insists that there won't be any miracles. You want to vet the legitimacy of Messiah, you don't ask for any miracles or signs or wonders. And in fact, the only difference between our world and the world of Messiah is the submission to foreign rulers. Ein bein olam azelam as Mashiach, el ashibud malchis bilvadi tells us. The wolf and lamb lying in peace, the fully formed bread emerging from the ground, these are all metaphors. What it means? We'll wait till Messiah comes. But it's not literal, says Rambam. Perhaps this too is an area of variability of Messiah. Messiah can come in many different ways, in different forms. Perhaps if we are meritorious, then those miracles can be literal. But if we're not meritorious, it'll come in its time. And all those supernatural descriptions of Messiah, the wolf and the lamb, the land begetting loaves, those are metaphorical. And the only difference between our world and the world of Messiah will be comparatively minor. The only difference is subjugation to foreign rulers. Now, it seems to me 
that we have definitive proof that there can be nature suspending miracles in the times of Messiah. So you recall, the Talmud tells us that, at least according to the opinion of the rabbis, not Rabbi Judah the Prince, a Kohen even today cannot drink wine. Why? Maybe Messiah will come and you'll be summoned to work in the temple and you have to be ready. So, first of all, you imagine that this would only be a concern if the temple is built instantaneously, if God reveals it from heaven. If we build it ourselves, even if we build it fast, ahead of schedule, under budget, if it's done by humans, you'll have sufficient lead time to sober up, you would imagine. But also, it seems to me, that proximity to the temple, at the temple grounds, should be considered. If someone's in Houston, Texas, they're sufficiently far away from the temple, by the time they hustle over, they will definitely have sobered up. And maybe that should not be a reason for them to restrict their alcohol intake. So evidently we see that the concern barring Kohanim from drinking would only be if the temple will be built instantaneously and somehow the Kohanim are spirited, they're teleported to the location in some miraculous fashion. But of course, all this is variable. Messiah is inevitable. We cannot change that. But what type of Messiah we actually get is highly variable in so many ways. We're going to repent. Why? Will we be inspired and awakened and return to God, embrace the Shabbos, embrace the mitzvos, go back to our roots? Or will we be forced into it? by Haman or a Haman-like figure. What kind of generation will be the generation of Messiah, righteous or wicked? Will it happen fast, in an expedited fashion, hastened due to our choices? Or will it be in its time? Maybe Nisan, maybe Tishrei. Will it happen quickly? Will Messiah arrive speedily or plodding like a pauper on a donkey? What's the experience like? Will it be the equivalent of finding a treasure or the sudden onset of a scorpion? Will we all survive? Will it follow the same 80-20 rule as was the case in Egypt? What will be with this Gog and Magog war? This apocalyptic war? What will be the fallout for that from that? The litany of degradations the Talmud tells us in the book of Sota that will severely degrade and debase the generation. Will that come to pass? The temple. We're going to get the temple. How so? In all these areas, the choice is ours. For meritorious, we'll earn a very pleasant Messiah. If we're not meritorious, well, then it's going to come despite of us in a way that will be less than desirable. Now, this principle, of course, resolves many of the questions from the sources, but it can also be used to resolve some of the erroneous predictions of the giants of our history. Now, the whole idea of messianic prognostication, can we try to predict when it's going to happen. That's a subject that, please God, we will talk about soon. But there are examples of veritable titans of our history who made predictions. And they gave dates when Messiah is going to come. And those dates arrived and passed and Messiah didn't come. Maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they did it for some other reason. We have to understand why they were allowed to make these predictions when the Talmud tells us not to. But those questions aside, given that we know that the timing of Messiah is variable under many different times, maybe they did not make a mistake. And those predictions, like the rabbi who met Messiah, the leper on the outskirts of Rome, they were contingent on our behavior. And perhaps in those times, they were just not up to the task. 
But this general idea of the variability of Messiah is a very good idea for us to think about, to consider. Messiah, we are getting regardless. But we're best advised to choose a good, righteous, pleasant, and meritorious path. May we all be so fortunate to witness the arrival of Messiah speedily in our days. There is yet a lot to cover in the Messiah series. I'm looking forward to continuing to study with y'all with the help of the Almighty. I'm enjoying this immensely. It's a blast, even if it's not always so pleasant, but better to know. It's better to know, to be able to prepare than to be ignorant and to be blindsided by a scorpion. I'm looking forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback. RabbiWolby at gmail.com.